Hello, happy Monday. Welcome to PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series. My name is Caitlin Rose, and I am the Stewardship Coordinator with Saskatchewan Prairie Conservation Action Plan, or PCAP. Today, Dr. Ryan Brook, Associate Professor with the University of Saskatchewan, will be speaking about wildlife research during a global quarantine, tracking the rapid spread of invasive wild pigs in Canada. Just a little bit of business before we begin, PCAP's Native Prairie Speaker Series is a monthly presentation, either in the form of a webinar or an in-person talk in the Saskatchewan community on anything to do with Native Prairie conservation or species at risk. Our next Native Prairie Speaker Series webinar is Tuesday, July 7th at 3 p.m. Melanie Toppy with the South of the Divide Conservation Action Program and the Frenchman Wood River Weed Management Area will be speaking about identification of invasive weeds. And you can register for this webinar through the PCAP website. All past presentations can be found on the PCAP YouTube channel, and this webinar will be uploaded there in the near future. I would like to take a moment to note that financial support for today's webinar is provided by our gold sponsors, Eco-Friendly SAP, Tempana Pipeline, Saskatchewan Cattlemen's Association, and Wildlife Habitat Canada. Our bronze sponsors, Camp Wolf Willow and Rancher Stewardship Alliance, Inc., as well as Environment and Climate Change Canada. A reminder to all of our listeners out there that as we have over 250 people registered, that you will be muted for the duration of the presentation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please feel free to type it into the questions section of the webinar dashboard at any time during the presentation, and questions will be answered at the end of the webinar. I am pleased to introduce today's presenter. Dr. Ryan Brook is an associate professor in the College of Agriculture and Bioresources at the University of Saskatchewan. He is the theme leader for Aboriginal Peoples and the Environment in the Indigenous Land Management Institute, professor in the Department of Animal and Poultry Science, as well as have been cross-appointed to the School of Environment and Sustainability and adjunct professor at the University of Manitoba. Raised on a farm near Winnipeg, he did his undergrad, master's, and PhD at the University of Manitoba and is postdoc in Caribou Health at the University of Calgary, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. His group, the Wildlife Ecology and Community Enga Engagement, pronounced WESI, works primarily on issues at the Wildlife Livestock Interface on the Canadian Prairies in collaboration with rural and indigenous people, but they have side hustles in the Arctic and jungles of Sri Lanka. Like all people that born in Manitoba, Ryan always has his left turn signal on at all times, no matter what. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to pass it over to Dr. Ryan Brook. Great, thank you so much for the kind introduction and hello to everybody out there. Um, while my presentation is loading here, I will assure you that I'm wearing a blazer and tie and dress pants and dress shoes. I'm definitely not wearing a Nike sweats and a t-shirt for sure. So keep that in mind that I'm perfectly well dressed now. Let's see if we can load this up. I think we're, there we go. I'm just gonna swap that around. You can see us okay there, Caitlin? We're all good? Yeah, perfect. Okay, perfect. So I'm gonna to talk today about some work that we've been doing on uh, wild pigs since I start, moved here to uh, Saskatoon and live in Saskatchewan. In 2010, I finally got a real job, as they might say, and, and worked at the University of Saskatchewan. And what we started with, uh, one of the first things we looked at was, I actually used my startup grant to do, was to start to look at this whole idea of uh, wild pigs in Canada. Uh, many refer to them as wild boar, feral swine. There's a number of terms out there. We use wild pigs as sort of consistent with other researchers and managers around the world uh, to reflect that these are a mixed bag of things from wild boar to, and as this photo shows, this is very much a hybrid with domestic pig and kind of got a whole bunch of different color phases and, and we'll see a real mixed bag of what we see on the landscape. So let's jump right into it and think a little bit of background about wild pigs. We talk a little bit about COVID and how we sort of are trying to grow and adapt and maybe even capitalize on some of the changes that have occurred because of COVID and that we have been unable for the last hundred days to be able to do anything in the field. 
So how do we sort of adapt and move forward on that? So let's jump into it. So a very quick background is uh, that wild pigs uh, are not native to North America, uh, but they were introduced probably on the order of 500 years ago in the Southern US and only starting really in the 80s and into the 90s here in uh, Saskatchewan and across Canada. All of the provinces at least dabbled in raising these. And this was a big push to diversify agriculture that we were gonna get away from conventional, you know, chickens and cows and wheat to other things to uh, emu to, I think there was a few caribou farms. I know somebody at least that tried to farm moose, uh, but wild boar were high on the list as well as an opportunity to, in, in two cases for, for meat, can more conventional meat farms, and also these high fence shoot operations where you can go in and shoot one yourself and weigh it and pay by the pound, which we still do have here in Saskatchewan and Alberta, Quebec, a few provinces have kept that up as well. But unfortunately, the, the sort of the background to this was that they went over, under and through fences and uh, started to escape. And unfortunately, that the market never really took off. And so that really peaked in 2001 and after that, we saw a real sharp decline in, in farming of these, although we still do have meat farms in Canada across many provinces, including the Yukon and the, these pen shoot operations. And here's an example of what unfortunately wasn't a great setup. Um, and so we're not surprised when we hear, when we see this kind of arrangement that there were some escapes. And this is a fairly recent photo of a farm that was uh, only about 30 kilometers outside of Saskatoon and a single strand of electric wire there and a pretty rickety fence not a whole lot to contain them and so there were escapes uh, the province was estimating around three percent what we were reading years ago um, and again the biggest problem here where i think the the we really ran into the biggest issue was that uh, we are looking at if you know that there were actually purposeful releases so they were cutting the fence and actually letting animals go through the fence and we saw in the order of 100, 200, uh, 300 plus. Um, and so we really, that was where this problem started to take off and through the 80s and 90s into the 2000s, we started to see that unfortunately against what a lot of people said was that they would never survive a cold Saskatchewan, Manitoba, Alberta winter or certainly not in the Yukon. Um, in fact, on the Canadian prairies, we've seen them thrive and do quite well and become established. And so our research has really been looking at the movements of them through GPS collars over five years. Uh, and one of the core efforts of our work starting in 2010 and going forward, who knows how far, uh, is tracking the distribution of these. And so looking at occupancy of sites across all of Canada. Certainly the, the Western Canadian prairies have the overwhelming majority of wild pigs, but one of our core goals from the beginning was to develop a map of Canada and track that spread of wild pigs. And again, this is very, very consistent with their biology anywhere else in the world. And so when we talk about animals getting out into the wild, uh, you know, my colleagues anywhere else around the world, Australia has many, you know, over 10 million, wild pigs the u.s has certainly many millions texas alone which is almost the exact same size as saskatchewan has on the order of two or three something in their million pigs and so what pigs do really really well is they're the most successful large mammal invasive species on earth and so they reproduce at alarming rates so here in saskatchewan they have six young per litter uh, multiple litters per year and they thrive on any kind of food in almost any kind of habitat. And so one of our challenges actually when we're making predictive maps is trying to identify, you know, what exactly is bad pig habitat because they're found in downtown Berlin, um, you know, all through big cities in, the, in Europe and Asia and, and increasingly so in some of the US cities. Uh, really remarkable number of established pigs in these urban areas as well. So it's this big global problem. And so in Canada, we're essentially seeing exactly what I think you would expect, given what we know about pigs and what we know about Canada and these big areas of native habitat and lots and lots of agriculture, which is food source, water and, and wetlands for them to wallow and hide in and forest cover to give them protection from hunters. So lots of conditions all came together to create, unfortunately, this perfect storm uh, where pigs uh, got out onto the landscape. And so one of the things that we first started using 
uh, was uh, trail cameras. And they're, they're relatively cheap, but they run 24-7, 365 days a year. You can put quite a number of them out. Um, and we started putting them out, but also we started getting images from other people as well. And this is really where, uh, you know, in for me, March 13th was the last day. Well, actually, the 12th was the last day in the office. I went to a conference in Saskatoon on March 13th, and that's it. I really haven't been uh, back on campus, and we haven't done any field work since. We're now thinking and talking about what next steps might look like for research. And although I would argue that work we've been doing is important, it's impossible to make the case this was essential research. And so any uh, field work, including checking our trail cameras and putting out more trail cameras has been halted. And so this is the point where we pause and said, okay, well, what, what does one do when you, and it's been quite unusual for us. Of course, we've had, I've had about 26 field seasons or 27 field seasons now, and uh, really kind of just give, take it as an assumption that you're gonna get out there and, keep doing, you might not have as much funding to do what you want to do all the time, but you're gonna go out and do some things. And so this has been a really interesting uh, pause for us. But one of the great things that I will say, uh, speaking to this photo, is this was not mine. This is a uh, uh, landowner slash hunter who lives up in the uh, sort of west central part of Saskatchewan sent it in. And what we have been able to do is obtain thousands of trail camera photos working with uh, people out on the landscape. And trail cameras, of course, have not only caught on in a dramatic way with research, trail cameras have really taken off for people who can go, you can go to Canadian Tire or Cabela's or Walmart, uh, maybe not Walmart, I might've made that up, but uh, certainly you go and really cheap, relatively cheaply, you can buy a whole bunch of trail cameras, even two or three and put them up on your property. This particular individual has found like many that these, uh, that, that square block in the front, is mineral so they put some sort of grain on the ground some people use canned cat food uh, the packages of strawberry jello powder have been very effective a uh, big jug of strawberry sauce for your ice cream from costco is works good any kind of spoiled grain corn um, there's uh, all, many different things that will work to draw in pigs uh, and certainly any kind of food will work roadkill many people will put kind of roadkill or leftovers from uh, you know, butchering deer and other animals. So they will come in for almost any kind of food and they really, really like the mineral blocks as well. And they'll come back to them because they, they, they might gobble up all that grain in one shot, but the mineral block will remain. So um, certainly that's been really, really interesting. And so one of the things that we've been working on right now is, is collecting and collating and going through and really uh, putting more effort into getting these images to, and of course, the wonderful thing about trail camera photos is, you know, some people set them up for at their deer sites to look at deer and that's their real priority is, okay, I want to see deer or maybe elk or moose, but they also catch anything that wanders by. These are motion activated and so they get all sorts of other things, including wild pigs. So while this one was specifically set up for pigs out of the interest of this person who hunts wild pigs, um, in practice, a lot of those images actually come from people, this is just bycatch, but they know we're interested and so we get them from all over Canada. Uh, not every single day, but pretty commonly get photos emailed to us or sent to me via Twitter or our Facebook page. Um, this came in actually fairly recently, a friend of mine, uh, not too far out of Saskatoon, this animal was coming in on the farm and actually harassing horses and put a chase on the horse so they had to put it down but this does not have the long drawn out snout that you would expect to see from a some form of wild pig. It's, this looks a lot like a pot belly pig to me. And so that's the other advantage of these kinds of programs where you're getting people sending in everything that they see that looks like a pig. And of course, there's not a lot out there in the landscape that one would confuse. Small black bears often uh, throw people, um, but not a lot else is confused, easily confused with the with the pig. And so we get this photo in it, and this is sort of another sideline point of concern, which we've seen again globally. Um, Potbelly pigs are great pets when they're what do they call them? Teacup pigs when they could fit in the palm of your hand. They're very cute. But when they get to this size and they're trying to sleep in your bed with you, it can be a little less exciting. And so people have habit, and again, not just in Saskatchewan, 
but globally of taking these pets and just dumping them out in the country. And it's not uncommon. And so some places in the US, uh, Spain has a huge problem uh, with these feral pot pigs. And of course, when they get to good size, they can do a lot of damage. So these are not wild boar, um, but they have a lot of problems associated with them. And so <laughs> we can see that there's a whole range of things going on here. We have, oh, and I, I didn't mention in the previous slide, you can see the really light colored one near the front. Those are actually uh, some free ranging domestic pigs that have no wild boar in them. And so that that's one of the main reasons why I don't use wild boar really anymore because uh, of the pigs in this photo, for example, uh, at least three or four are, have no wild boar in them whatsoever and certainly this one wouldn't either and so um, a number of things coming up from these photos and this gives us a like I say we have been able to do a bit of a pause and really spend a lot of time digging through and collecting more photos and so our database literally contains thousands of images um, we also have been able to do some work and continue to monitor uh, sound sounder size this is what we call a sounder Normally, there's one big mature female that's the boss and she runs the show and then her daughters and uh, several generations, probably great granddaughters of the females will stick around. Males, once they're mature, will, will take off and, and travel around the landscape um, and returning only to mate with females that are in estrus. But one thing that's, of course, striking of these sounders is because they are reproducing continuously, there is no season. So, you know, for elk and deer and moose, we sort of just recently just wrapped up our, our calving season. So all of those young are born once per year. You know, elk would only ever have one deer and elk, uh, or pardon me, elk would only ever have one deer and moose might have a couple, three. You know, I saw once a picture of a moose with five young, and that was quite amazing and, and almost certainly she didn't give birth to all of those I think but with these pigs uh, you know six per litter and in this case with multiple sows per litter you will see lots and lots of young at, at heel and it'll be very rare to see a sounder group uh, without young at, at often multiple stages and lots of them so that reproduction is really really characteristic and certainly one of the big drivers of what makes them so successful as an invasive species and what makes them so really, really hard to uh, reduce the population or eradicate. Because with elk, you have to be really careful. You don't over harvest. You can over harvest and take a decade to recover. But with these wild pigs, you can see with this reproductive rate, and again, this is uh, more than once per year, uh, just really, really high outputs of piglets. And so you can remove lots of animals. Uh, and especially if you're removing the young animals, you have a relatively limited impact. If you're removing that mature female, you may start to see some decline, but trying to eliminate pigs is an incredible global challenge, which I guess, quite frankly, nobody has really figured out the exact magic answer to yet. And everybody everywhere around the world, uh, both in their native range, where they are true wild boar, but have expanded dramatically out of control. and like I say, Australia and the US, there, there's a lot of work and a lot of effort trying to figure out what is the, what's the magic solution here for eradicating these across the landscape. And so this one I thought actually is funny because uh, a friend of mine who's a professional photographer and nature guide, has a PhD, knows really good science, she thought this was a black bear at first. And you can see, I think at first glance, when you jam on the brakes on the side of the road where you might be easily confused, by that but when you zoom in closer and you see that big long drawn out nose then you do uh, see quite clearly indeed of course that is a, that's a wild pig running around in quite far southern Manitoba this particular shot and of course no surprise seeing them in the agricultural crops and uh, causing quite a lot of damage along the way. So these are the kinds of images we get um, obviously, one of the challenges, and I'll speak to this in a bit, is that these are all wonderful and incredibly useful, but we also have to think in terms of a science context, how do you interpret and use these because, you know, these are not being collected and reporting is not consistent. Some people report and some don't. And so there are some really, really significant and important limitations to this, especially when we're talking about the area of Saskatchewan and beyond for all of Canada. And certainly our efforts uh, are being paired and we've been developing some transboundary maps now looking at all of Canada and the US as, uh, as a bigger context. And so we have to think pretty carefully about what, you know, what, what are the upsides to all of this and the data that we can pull from it, but what are the, what are the limitations? And so we've spent quite a lot of time 
looking at that in some detail. I'll speak to that in a bit. Um, other thing is documenting impacts, which is really important as well, and saying, okay, what is, well, you know, why here and, and what's going on? And so this is a cemetery uh, in Melita, Manitoba, that's been hit pretty hard by what is very obviously wild pigs, that rooting, that ripping up of the ground is very characteristic of that species. Highway collisions are a, certainly a concern in the US and have been an impact. There have been a few in Canada, thankfully none fatal that I know of, but certainly some significant ones. And I'll just show this little video that was uh, sent to me. Hopefully it plays on your computer okay, but this is on the highway up past uh, Melford towards Tisdale and big group of pigs just standing in the middle of the highway. And obviously, luckily that was daylight and despite the rain, they were able to stop and observe and then they ran off eventually, but they were standing right in the middle of the highway. So some interesting sightings from our perspective in terms of occurrence, but also speaks to some of those risk factors and oops, I did it again, pop myself out there. Um, uh, and so important concern there in terms of of uh, safety, but again, documenting those occurrences, and we get thousands and thousands of these. This is from Lake Diefenbaker. Um, somebody sent these to us uh, on Twitter actually and said, Oh, by the way, we were out on Diefenbaker and we saw a log floating, and so we thought we'd better get it out there so nobody hit it. It turns out that there was a group of wild pigs uh, quite far from shore swimming across the lake. They're incredible swimmers. They float like corks. And it doesn't show in this photo very well, uh, but if, if you zoom in on some of them, you'll actually see that there are, uh, one female has two piglets on her back uh, carrying them across the water. And so some of them are carrying piglets as they went. And so some really interesting, uh, and again, that, you know, documenting those, these are for, in some ways, you know, for, uh, for Ruth Ashen, who's doing her PhD with me and mapping these out, and for uh, Corey Kramer, who's doing his master's, looking at uh, the distribution, crop damage, and movements. These are dots on a map saying, hey, this is where they are. These are occurrences. But then uh, they're also really interesting insights to the ecology because we know from reading that they can swim well. And we've, we, you know, there's one thing to look, dig into the literature. But it's another to see that confirmed here in Saskatchewan and them doing the kinds of things that we see elsewhere. And let's see if I can get to the next one. We see these, uh, again, different types of pigs coming in. So hunters also send a lot of photos our way, not from trail cameras, but from their actual harvests. They like to show what they collected. They don't always want to share exactly where they shot it. They're very protective as you would expect and is absolutely fair game about their uh, their sightings and their data but we're seeing these very pink pigs uh that are that were out running on the landscape as well as you know conventional looking wild wild these the animal the adults here look very much like wild boar big hairy beasts uh, but if you look at that piglet on the left it's quite light colored and there's definitely some significant hybridization going on there with uh, that animal does not have the characteristic horizontal cream colored stripes and actually the across the back is quite pink and so clearly has a significant amount of, of domestic pig genetics in there as well and so we're looking at uh, sounder size and certainly one of the things that we've noticed already is that in our early days uh, of using these images and we also have been running uh, uh, sets of our own trail cameras as well and those are systematic blocks and we plan to put hopefully about eight more blocks in Saskatchewan uh, once this uh, COVID is over and we're, we're over whatever that means or back to some business as usual or at least some capacity to get back on the field um, and put out more blocks of trail cameras in, in six by six arrays. But certainly um, what I will say though is that, and that gives us a bit more systematic view and we can start to think about density and, and calculating something more systematic but also very much complementary to these photos that we get literally from all over Canada. Um, but certainly again, mostly on the prairies, but, but BC, Ontario, Quebec, we've, we've received a number of images. So we can look at group size only. What I was going to say was that when we first started, we were seeing groups of four to seven was very common. Uh, we, I remember being quite excited when we saw a group of 11 and now we're starting to see these sounder groups. Um, certainly we've seen several photos uh, you know, on the order of two to three dozen animals. And so we're definitely seeing more big sounders than we've ever seen before. 
Um, so this is just, I'll show a little bit of data um, and show that one of the things that was really remarkable in our findings to me was that we were seeing uh, piglets being born in all months. And so what we can do, and we've, uh, I had a student, uh, Bailey, who did her undergraduate thesis with me, and she, did, working with me, she developed an aging guide to wild piglets uh, using some known, Im known aged images of wild pigs in the field, but also uh, with a whole bunch of photos that we obtained of wild, uh, domestic wild boar on farms or wild pigs, whatever you want to call them, some sort of hybrid, but in, uh, raised on farm. Now we know they're being fed differently and raised somewhat differently, but we can see those changes on a daily basis by getting photographs of lots of different domestic farms on the prairies. And so we've developed a, an aging guide where you can look at a photo and say, okay, that, that piglet is, is about four months old. And then based on that, you can backtrack to about when it was born. And what we're seeing here is uh, when those piglets are first, uh, the age of, of relatively newborn piglets in their first month are seen in all seasons of the year. Now, less so in late winter, we're not sure because with trail cameras, we also have to consider the fact that uh, during that period, we tend to see lower activity, but certainly um, confirmed in all months, uh, obviously some more than others. Um, and this is particularly, I think, one of the most important take homes from the data so far. And this is uh, something we're in the process of updating a, a 2020 map and we'll show some of the mapping data right away here. But one of the things that's been very clear from our data and, and you know, pre-2010, those are all data that Ruth collected as part of her PhD by doing uh, interviews, uh, looking at trail cameras, uh, photographs of harvested animals and collecting historical data. This is what we, this is what we documented before. And again, this is exactly consistent. I think if you talk to many states in the US, uh, many parts of Australia uh, and other areas where they've been introduced uh, around the world, we tend to see these kinds of curves exactly being what wild pigs tend to do, uh, reproduce a lot and spread uh, spatially. So we're seeing a lot more occurrences in the last three years than we've ever seen before. Um, and again, this is what we, so if you go back to 2010, when we first started all this research, this was exactly what we predicted um, and saying that we don't exactly know, you know, how fast they're going to spread or reproduce, but we certainly based on what we know about them that we predict they're going to spread rapidly and they, indeed uh, they have. And this one I wanted just to dig a little bit more into and show that um, from, from Ruth's PhD work is that if you take a whole bunch of different data sets, if you look at um, uh, occurrences from all methods, which is A, uh, uh, panel A, uh, snowball sampling of talking to people, you do interviews, she talked to uh, biologists and, and other folks across the landscape and interviewed them about what they've seen and heard. We had the bounty data from Alberta, which was over a thousand animals and where they were situated and how they were collected. Um, and then the, we did a big national scale tele, telephone survey. And what is interesting is that while the shape of the curve is not exactly the same, the trend overall very much is it all towards an increase. And uh, this is up to 2017. And really the, a, a major focus uh, of this particular quarantine has been to update that. And we'll, the plan is already that we recognize that as fast as we can build maps and track the spread as they become out of date, given the tremendously rapid uh, spread at, at a rate of about 90,000 square kilometers per year is what, what Ruth and I have documented. So this is what uh, it looked like in Canada. Um, the red is the red. Each red splotch is a water, a level nine watershed, and we chose level nine because that's a, we think it's a good representative of uh, home range. It's quite a conservative estimate, but it, it looks about pretty close to the size of a home range of a, a wild pig. And so, if there's presence of an animal, then that watershed turns red and um, we, that doesn't speak to density and we don't have good density data yet so this is just simply occurrence data but what you can see is that already in the prairies there were some you know by 2000 we certainly were aware of some animals in the wild probably more than this but this is what we we had at the time um, and then by 2010 when we first started our research uh, you know active field research uh, we already had some well-established populations in Saskatchewan, Alberta, and Manitoba, some sightings in BC, 
and an increasing concern about how fast these things are going to spread. And 2017, as Ruth's most recent map for her PhD, she's wrapping up here and will be defending soon. So that's the end of her uh, focus for her PhD work. Um, and what, well, like I say, one of the things that we, well, two things I want to point out. One is that we've seen a really, really rapid spread, you know, 90,000 square kilometers per year, big expansion, um, but also started to show up in Ontario and Quebec. And that um, the reality is that we're working on a 2020 update for that now, have that soon. And the unfortunate reality is that that curve continues to increase exponentially and we're seeing more and more occupied watersheds. So the spread is there much like uh, you would expect from a forest fire or cancer cells or uh, or for a, or a virus for that matter is that you know all it takes is one spot and they can spread incredibly rapidly from there and with wild pigs particularly because there were so many farms spread across Canada uh, it wasn't just a single site where this started from there have been lots and lots and indeed there still are wild boar farms out there uh, that are leaky, and we know they're leaky, um, and, and releasing more pigs on into the landscape as well. Um, in terms of linking this to impacts, uh, we've taken a couple of tacks on this, and uh, one of the things we're looking at is the potential spread of wild pigs north into the boreal forest and how that might impact uh, boreal caribou. Um, and also Ruth's work, one of her chapters, which I think we'll have uh, a manuscript out of that pretty soon, uh, looking at piping plovers. And one of the concerns about pigs is that we know they are nest predators. We know they walk along shorelines and just gobble up any frogs, <laughs> salamanders, eggs, young, uh, anything they can eat, they just scoop it up, right? They're just uh, completely broad foragers who, will, if there's some grain, they'll eat it. If they can rip up some cattails and eat the roots, they'll do that. If they find some frogs, they'll eat them, you know, whatever it is. And so in terms of both disturbance and nest predation, we really worry about piping plover and her work is looking at that overlap and showing some uh, not tremendous overlap and, and maybe not anything to be particularly alarmed about today right now, but given the increase in spread of them, um, certainly raises the uh, concern for more research and more monitoring to look at you know what what might be coming as they continue to expand. This is work from uh, my summer student last year and this year uh, Maya Clywer she was looking at and this is in southern Manitoba and the solid lines represent basically all of the skinks in Canada with I think there's one tiny little pocket just off the screen to the left but Basically, this represents the uh, kernel density home range uh, of all of the points uh, of known skink in Canada. So this one part of southwestern Manitoba has uh, prairie skinks and they're hanging on by the edge and they've been struggling, obviously, and this kind of small uh, patch makes them endangered. And But unfortunately, now you add this overlap and we're starting to see this hatched area where we're seeing spatial overlap with uh, wild pigs and significant amount of that is overlap and again pigs are rooters they dig up the ground and they smell incredibly well and so both in terms of habitat impact and potentially as nest predators <coughs> that big uh, uh, beige area to the left of the shaded is actually a military base and on that they did find they have had some monitoring of nests and they did find one that was torn up which they think is most likely wild pig uh, that's the only on the ground uh, data we have so far, but we want to do some more monitoring and see. But as these pigs expand, and, and, uh, uh, and that's just from our collar data, in fact, from sighting data, we have a much broader expanse, expanse in Manitoba. Pretty significant concern there. Um, and then overlap with protected areas. So uh, working with uh, a number of different data sets, looking at the, pro uh, Ruth has looked at the probability of occurrence of wild pigs on, in, on the left uh, Ducks Unlimited lands and on the right uh, NCC lands and starting to see some, some places that there's, you know, the dark brown is the high likelihood of occurrence. And so raising some significant concerns around impacts on these, uh, these important lands, whether it's for, for waterfowl or, or well, almost any species, anything on the ground, there's going to be some potential impact there. Certainly impacts on wetlands are very, very well documented. Ripping up that ground, feeding on those cattails, uh, that sort of thing. And so uh, this is a point of considerable concern and she's looking at other protected areas as well and thinking about and looking at how different animals 
uh, are at risk and different habitats and different, no, uh, different you know, in this case, uh, NGOs doing really important conservation work, what's the risk there? So that's sort of a, a snapshot of just a, a few pieces of research that are right in the middle of right now uh, working on, and these are sort of hot off the presses first drafts, and they, they may, may well change a little bit, but I wanted to share some insights that we've had a little bit of time to pause and look at our data, but also to think about ways that we've been able to get a lot of great data, even while we're, I've been stuck in my basement for 100 days, but we've got well over 100 uh, new images of pigs and lots of sightings and things have come on as well. So I think we've been able to uh, not survive, I guess is the right word when we talk about getting through these COVID things and doing uh, some good science, but while still stuck, science in the basement is what I've been calling it for a while now. So that's a couple of snapshots. Um, in terms of what we don't know, we don't have good data on population size and density. That's the number one question. How many are there? We don't know that yet. And we can't do that with just sighting data, people sending in cameras here and there. We'll never get a good estimate of population size from that. That will only, in my view, really come from networks of trail cameras. Uh, how far north will they move? And you know, linking that to caribou and other things is certainly a point of concern. We don't know a whole lot about disease. There's a lot of concern about Canadian pigs moving south into the US. That's a very valid, important concern at a number of points. And then the other one, which um, I'll speak to briefly before I wrap up here, is uh, urban establishment. And this photo actually came quite a long time ago. This is probably about eight years ago. Someone had pigs coming right in their backyard, um, not too far from the edge of the city, saying, geez, this is a concern. What's going on here, Ryan? I said, well, yeah, these are potentially concerning for a whole bunch of reasons, and here's what you might do about it. But it's really got us thinking about, um, you know, knowing that they move into the edges of cities and certainly Corman Park around Saskatoon, the RM of Corman Park around Saskatoon, they've had for many, many years, they've had someone on contract. I don't know if they still do, but for many years, they had someone who was in charge of finding and removing wild pigs in the RM of Corman Park. And so we know they've been around the city for a long time in Saskatoon. We know that we've had some sightings not that far from Regina. Um, you know, this is, in my view, a matter of time before we start to see some sightings closer and closer into the city, especially Saskatoon with a river valley running right through it. And so this is a project that's coming up next. Um, so Katie Harris has started her master's with me. We have been on hold and getting these cameras out, but we have uh, each circle with the dot represents a spot where we're going to set up a trail camera uh, through a stratified random design. And this is a really exciting project, a collaboration uh, through not only the University of Saskatchewan, but Lawson, uh, Saskatoon Forestry Farm Park bought all the cameras for this, uh, Nature in the City, uh, City of Saskatoon. And, and several others we're working with to hopefully get uh, signed on right away here as well. And this is gonna be a nice collaborative effort to look at wildlife in the city. And one of the reasons that I'm particularly interested in this is for a whole, well, certainly look at biodiversity in its own right, but looking at things like potentially cougar coming in, but also wild pigs. And uh, certainly some of those, those cameras along the edge, the black dots are ones that uh, Miwasan already has operating. And the, the big giant circles with the dot are the ones we will be putting out as soon as we get the green light from the university that we're safe to go back in the field um, and be monitoring for that. And so this is going to be a long-term project over certainly, hopefully at least decades to track you know, wildlife occurrences and things like white-tailed deer won't surprise us too much and foxes and coyotes and that, but, uh, but what other things from from uh, wild pigs to cougar might we see as well. And if you remember of last fall, there was a number of photos of a pronghorn circulating out not too far from the, uh, the city dump. And so what kind of interesting animals pop up will be particularly interesting. And what we have found, and we've already published a study um, just this last year looking at from the rural data, showing how when wild pigs show up, how the biodiversity changes and how that some species are not that uh, fairly closely associated with pigs. And so moose and wild pigs show up a lot in the same kinds of wetland habitats. And they probably, moose are big enough to be the least likely directly impacted. And, and uh, but things like deer and elk will uh, tend to avoid them. And so we, we have some quite interesting uh, community-based results of that essentially say, you know, what happens when wild pigs show up? 
So that is a uh, fairly quick overview of some of the things we've been thinking and talking about over the last 100 days of COVID and uh, mostly snapshots of work in progress rather than show you the stuff that's that's been done. Um, the overwhelming majority of this research over the last uh, seven years has been funded by the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They've been incredibly supportive, not only financially, but also in terms of massive logistic support and just amazing collaboration. So they, uh, none of this uh, work on wild pigs would be happening to very much of a degree at all uh, without them. But certainly Ruth has been supported by Saskatchewan Wildlife Federation. The U of S, uh, you know, got this right off the ground with Startup Grant and lots of support for me. Huge, huge uh, contribution there. We've been funded on and off by Fish and Wildlife Development Fund and Sask Pork has contributed to this as well. They certainly see the, the concerns and potential impacts here with respect to uh, domestic pig industry. So lots of concern and risk to go around to a whole bunch of whether it's NGOs trying to protect some various bird species to uh, folks in the egg industry. There's a whole bunch of reasons why we need to be really worried about these things. So with that, I will say thank you very much. And I uh, would be certainly happy if we have time to jump into some, some questions if people have and a bit of discussion. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That was a really awesome presentation. Um, some of our listeners do have questions already. Um, I guess the, the first one is um is it possible for people to get a copy of the presentation oh for sure yeah absolutely yeah we can uh we can circulate if you have the email list maybe you can just post it or yeah however i'm more than happy to share whatever we produce anytime yep okay okay perfect i guess if i get a copy from you then i can post it on the pcap website or email it out to um to webinar registration yeah that and would my work out. And my email is front and center there if people have other questions or follow up or or if you want to talk about you know if you have some data on species x and you're interested in you know what kind of potential overlap are we looking at here I'd be more than happy to talk with you okay perfect so we've got a few um questions from listeners a listener named carol would like to know if wild boar and domestic pigs are considered to be separate species even though they can interbreed that's a great question. No, uh, all of the pictures I've shown you are all of what we call suscrofa, so they're all they're all from the same uh, same situation. Now they are obviously quite different in terms of looks, but what is interesting is you go to any domestic pig barn in Saskatchewan and buy a pure, beautiful pink pig, and you put it out in the wild it will go wild very quickly it will grow fur um you know in the next generation because one of the things you do at weaning with domestic pigs is you cut you trim off the those two sharp teeth which are quote unquote the tusks and so uh you would start to see those animals even after a single generation would look a whole lot different than what they were in the barn but no they're all the same species they can all interbreed and they do and in fact that was one of the recommendations when they were raised inside a fence uh, when they were first brought over was a lot of experts said, well, if you want big animals, if you want high reproductive rates, uh, and if you want, you know, more frequent, then cross those wild boar with domestic pigs. And that's where that hybridization started. So, yeah, they can, in, they can and do interbreed. Uh, and unfortunately, that also means that they're attracted to each other. Not only, you know, uh, wild pigs will be attracted to pig barns, for example, for feed, but also when females are estrus, or in estrus, you know, in a in the in the barns or in these backyard operations, that that a, a female in estrus uh, in, inside the fence will attract these big males. And you know, we've handled the biggest sow we handled was 638 pounds, and some of these males are certainly a number of have been shot that are over 400 pounds. So. Yeah, it does, uh, that potential for breeding has, has really helped them. Unfortunately, if this was just true wild boar, I think we would actually be, uh, control efforts would be a lot easier, unfortunately. Hmm, that's so interesting. Um, a listener named Michael would know, would like to know why, um, why some pigs have sh shorter snouts. Um, you mentioned that earlier. Is that because of genetic um, yeah. injury or something else? Yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, it, it almost certainly is related to genetics in that, um, again, these have been crossed with, like we have, we're right in the middle of doing genetic analysis with my colleagues in the USDA from a whole bunch of samples we have from Canada. And 
it doesn't look like there's many, if any, true pure wild boar uh, running around the landscape uh, or inside the fence for that matter. Um, and so, yeah, we see mixed pig. And so the uh, domestic pig has a long nose, but that wild boar has a really drawn out snout. And so it's a mixture of wild boar and domestic pig. And then of course these pot belly pigs have these really stubbed noses and are quite characteristic. So yeah, lots of variation across Suscrofa for sure. And a lot of that yeah. is natural. There's because they're global, um, uh, literally found pigs, various types of pigs are found around the world. Um, lots of lots of native diversity, but uh, a lot of bred diversity as well over, you know, obviously hundreds of generations. <coughs> wow. Um, there's a couple of listeners writing in about um, predators. Do you know anything about their predators here? We do, we know in their native range, uh, for example, in the mountains of Italy, their wolves will predate on them. Um, and so it's possible. But one thing that we find is that if you look at that overall map that Ruth has made of the distribution of them, the overwhelming majority are on the Canadian prairies where we've removed virtually, you know, we had, uh, we had prairie grizzly at one point um, and those are gone and you don't see wolves. Wolves were common on the prairies, but they've been largely eliminated in the prairies. And so for most of their range, there are no predators to speak of other than coyotes, which we don't think coyotes are going to have a chance with a, you know, you look at those photos of sound or say a, a sounder of 10, which is not huge. Um, and you imagine each animal weighing, you know, say on average 100 pounds. That's a lot of animal. They can be super aggressive. They're unbelievably aggressive, actually, and kind of scary to work with. I'm not going to lie. And so uh, I don't, we don't think that predation is a factor hardly at all. I do know one person who I have every reason to believe, um, who is probably one of the most knowledgeable people about wild pigs in Saskatchewan. He saw in his work killing pigs uh, a site where a wolf had killed a pig. And so I know of one story of that. We never lost any of our GPS collared animals to predation. And uh, along the forest fringe, and certainly as pigs move north, and we've had a number of sightings fairly well in the boreal forest, that could change. Um, there we, you know, you see big packs of wolves. Um, that might potentially change and there might be some predation. So nothing that I know, you know, very, very little right now and, and I expect it to be very rare in, in, except in and around that, the, the border forest, yeah. Okay, interesting, thank you. Um, so there's a listener named Jennifer that's wondering about um, the wild pigs that have shown up in Ontario and Quebec. Um, are they migrating um, from Western Canada or um, are they believed to have originated from farms? Um, do you know what's going on there? Uh, the genetics will help to resolve that. And that's an, another reason why genetic analysis is so useful is once you have a good database of farmed animals and wild animals, if you, if you bring me an ear from a pig and say, what the heck is going on here? Then through the lab, um, they can really say, well, this pig looks like it came from, you know, it was actually raised on a farm, probably somewhere in Saskatchewan or Alberta. Um, until we have all the genetics sorted out, we don't know. Uh, I haven't been able to get any genetic data from Quebec or Ontario yet, but probably the most likely answer is because there are wild boar farms spread across Canada, all the provinces at least dabbled in it. Quebec is probably right now on the order of 50 to 60 wild boar farms. Um, Ontario has had a, a bit of a mixed history as well and so certainly the most likely scenario is they probably escape from various um, whether it's farms or high fence shoot operations or or indeed you know there's various kinds of across Canada uh, animal sort of I don't know if you call them sanctuaries or or some of these kinds of things people have all sorts of animals uh, i saw a siberian tiger in a fence in southern manitoba a number of years ago and literally jammed on the brakes with shock and surprise so um, <laughs> there there are a few sources out there but i think farmed uh, is probably the the obvious one even right now after all of these years and all of the movements and dispersal if you look at it, all of the things that we've used to try and predict where wild pigs are in the landscape uh, whether it's forest or wetland or, or avoiding highways or various types of, we, we have good maps of all kinds of, every kind of crop uh, you can imagine across the prairies as well. 
And those are all important, but at the end of the day, the best predictor is the, the presence of uh, current or past wild boar farms. So if you have those dots on the landscape uh, of where those farms are now and where they were over the last 20 years, that's by far the best predictor of where pigs will be. So yeah, I, I think we could pretty safely say that they're, they're sourced locally. In the U.S., they do have a lot of issues of people purposely seeding, seeding wild pigs into the wild. And so, you know, they have these pictures of a minivan pulled on the side of the interstate highway that's uh, crammed full with six wild pigs jammed in the back of a minivan to be seeding stock. I heard of some of those stories early on here in Canada, but there just doesn't seem to be a lot of that. And um, I do see on Kijiji ads for you can buy bread sows, you could buy you know number of piglets and that sort of thing. So there's opportunities to get uh, these wild boar and and put them in the wild. I don't really think that happens that much as far as we can tell. It's of course it, I, it's probably illegal and it's not necessarily something people brag about. So it's always more difficult to talk about those things. But certainly my sense after 10 years of this is that we're not probably seeing much purposeful uh, releases. Like in terms of uh, people actually hunters just putting them out there to create hunting opportunities. Mm, okay, thanks for that answer. We have a number of questions about uh, management of pigs. Uh, what is the most um, effective way to discourage wild pigs from an area? Is hunting a viable control and are there any best management practices for landowners? That's a fantastic question. It's probably the most complicated question of today. I think there's a one of the things we've learned from other jurisdictions and, and indeed from experience here in Canada is that there are certainly things you can do about pigs. So, um, uh, and indeed, there have been some success stories in the more northern states. Like we don't think, you know, in Texas doesn't talk about eradicating wild pigs, Florida, California. I mean, they have them almost over 100 percent of their range. And so there they're trying to reduce damage. And one of the best options for reducing damage and impacts is fencing. So good quality fencing um, is very, very important. So whether that's a fencing around the perimeter of your domestic pig farm or if you have a garden, if you have your prize rose bushes, uh, we've seen animals coming in to, you know, town of Stoughton had a big release, 300 uh, wild boar were released and they were coming right into the town and, and destroying gardens and things. And so fencing is certainly a, the, the most effective and doing on your own, your own landscape to keep them away. Sport hunting is interesting in that, I will say that um, hunters are great because they provide samples for biological research have great working relationship with lots and lots of hunters uh, and this is fantastic but uh, and th the other thing I will say on the Canadian prairies is we have quite a lot of what we call a culture of fear in wild pigs and that they have been shot at a lot and so that's a double-edged sword in the sense that that culture of fear means that we don't see them um, you know many many people have them and we see this with the trail camera data um, knock on a door, say, hey, can we set up a trail camera in your back 40 there? And they kind of laugh and say, well, there's no pigs around here. And we set up a trail camera and find, indeed, they have 11 living there uh, almost full time. And so uh, a lot of people don't know they're around. And that does keep them away from, you know, you don't see them just wandering midday right into, uh, you know, down 8th Street in Saskatoon or something. And so that culture of fear does provide some benefits because they get shot at a lot. The downside, though, and this is a massive downside, is that uh, sport hunting also puts, because it puts the fear into them and makes them wary, is that the more you shoot at them and the more you harvest them, the more uh, nocturnal they become and the more they hide in the thickest, heaviest, you know, riparian willow, ugly cover they can hide under. And so they're much, much harder for any kind of government programs, for example, to find and remove. And so sport hunting is a really major barrier to eradication. Um, and it also, unfortunately, can break up and disperse groups as well. And so uh, there have been several states in the US and uh, northern US states that have uh, New York State, for example, uh, very recently, Colorado declared themselves wild pig free. So they have effectively eradicated wild pigs from the entire state. So it can be done. But uh, to answer the question directly, sport hunting uh, is not an effective tool, largely because the, they travel in these groups. And so the likelihood if there's this group of seven of a hunter or two hunters getting all seven is very, very low. 
And so you see seven and you shoot two or three and you, wow, that's great. I made my contribution. I killed 40% of the animals or whatever, but those ones that remain will probably still continue to reproduce, spread across the landscape even further, and they be, just become super wary and really hard to find. And so uh, overall sport hunting is sort of been, again, this sort of double-edged sword, but in terms of long-term prospects for large-scale eradication, they're, they are probably the most significant barrier um, and then really in a lot of ways make the problem worse. And so having the professionals do it is really the answer uh, is to, and in Saskatchewan, you just call uh, Saskatchewan Crop Insurance and they have people that shoot and snare and trap pigs and they do it really, really well and they know exactly what they're doing and they will take out entire sounder groups. And so that's, if it was, if my back 40 had pigs in it, I would call them immediately and, and ask for their help to come and do it on a professional basis. But, but yeah, things you can do, certainly reporting sightings uh, for our mapping efforts has been you know, really important to get the message of where pigs are. And so understanding those risks and, and I've said many times that Ruth has literally and figuratively put wild pigs on the map and that, People were talking about them certainly before we arrived, but I think that those maps of hers and the data we found and having thousands of photos and GPS colored pigs has really sort of brought this to the notion that this is a real issue. And I think everybody's taking it a lot more seriously than they did 10 years ago for sure. So that's a very long drawn out answer <laughs> to a short question, but it's a complicated question indeed, but certainly leaving it to the professionals is probably the short answer I should have started with. <laughs> <laughs> so um if somebody sees a wild a wild pig um one that's acting aggressively maybe or or just um see one the best thing they could do would be to report their sighting is that correct yes absolutely and certainly if it's a you know if this is a if it's a safety concern i would call 911 right off the bat if this was you know in my yard and i feared for my family or or you know something like that um and certainly uh if in case of you know you're concerned about livestock or pets then if that opportunity presents itself i would also shoot that pig on site if you know obviously you don't want to leave it to the professionals and wait till tuesday uh if there's a, if there's something you know in a very immediate risk that you can either scare it off or 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 if you have to in the case of you know the horses were getting harassed by that that pig and so they shot it and of course that's exactly the thing that you can and should do um so yeah lots of options and, and you know one thing i always try and talk about with wildlife stuff especially with wild pigs even 10 times more so is this idea of having a toolbox and saying that you know that that sort of line that if if all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail and if all you think is and, and we see this a lot is that you know we have problem wildlife often the only answer is to shoot them and that, you know, oh, we have wolf wolf uh, causing some uh, depredation on cattle. Oh, gotta shoot them, gotta get uh, kill them, kill them. Well, that's one tool in the toolbox and it's not one to be ignored, but fencing, education, you know, communicating, working with uh, the real experts that are out there. There's a whole toolbox out there of things that you can do yourself and bring other people in. And we're more than happy to help uh, with anybody who has questions and I'm, I'm sure the uh, governments of all the provinces are, are well set and increasingly setting themselves up to be to be really helpful and informative and, and deal with these issues. Thanks for that answer. Um, if somebody shot a pig, would they get in trouble? Like, is there an open season on it or how does that work? Uh, it depends where you are, uh, each province, and this is a bit of a challenge where I think it would be nice to see a little bit more harmony, but uh, each province has its own set of regulations. But I, I think it would be broadly fair to say that if you're protecting your family or your livestock, uh, that you would you'd certainly be able to shoot that. Um, on the Canadian prairies, there, it is largely open season. Um, certainly, you want to check with conservation officers and get the the exact details there's a you know whether you can bait or not and and, and certainly across canada uh, hunting at night i think with few if any exceptions would be illegal as well and this is one of the challenges as well is that if if you're only able to shoot during daylight um, that is relatively limiting of course so yeah, uh, so for Saskatchewan, people go out and, and hunt them for sure, and you can. Um, and again, I'm not, uh, despite my concerns about the, the role that wild pigs play and that hunting is you know, really one of the big challenges and barriers to eradication and success, 
I'm not against sport hunting, but certainly a lot of people have this idea that they can go out and shoot some pigs tomorrow and put some in the freezer. Great. Yeah. If that's what you want to do, then certainly the government of Saskatchewan has said that absolutely you are legal to do that. And, and I support that and that's you're right um, but don't pretend that that's helping with the problem the, uh, a lot of people say well i need to do my part to control killing two wild pigs out of a sounder um, that's just not unfortunately going to get us there so i know that's probably been one of the most toughest messages i've had to share in my career and a lot of people don't want to hear it and i've sort of been had my chops busted and more than more than a few times for for saying this sort of stuff it'd be easy and polite and nice to just say yeah go kill them all and this is great but reality is that that's not getting us there and you see that exponential curve right and through that curve you know certainly in the last 10 years for sure there have been a lot of hunters out on the landscape and also not just hunters you know sitting in deer stands that happen to see them but people that go out intentionally to shoot wild pigs and also people that have you know firearms with them on the combine or out in the field and also shoot them as they can but yet they still continue to increase exponentially so there's no evidence in our science to indicate that sport harvest has done anything but just watch pigs numbers uh, expand and expand mm -hmm. yeah what do you think is the best form of control uh, i would say that there is no one uh, perfect solution that generally speaking i would say uh well i guess it depends on the phase let's first of all for example if there, so for Ontario is a good example where they have a few showing up in a few places um, that would be best done by probably a couple of methods, but each method has its own benefits and its own limitations. And so uh, ground trapping has been really embraced uh, by Alberta and Saskatchewan, and they've really made an art form of it and really figured out these big, large panel traps. Uh, you can catch entire sounder groups and you know there's a video if you go onto one of the manufacturers site i think they catch 50 some pigs in one shot uh, with two of these big traps side by side and so you can really do a lot of removal with these and so they're a really big tool in the toolbox for sure in the u.s is i don't know how many hundreds perhaps thousands of these traps are operating in the u.s right now they do capture a lot of pigs but that tends to work for sounders, whereas, so we have these sounders moving around and then we have these big lone males that just wander the landscape. And because those females are reproducing continuously, they move all year round and visit all of the sounders and constantly checking for any females that are receptive to breeding. And so how do you catch those big males? Some will come into those traps as well, uh, but not always. And some of the really smart, mature females, you know, you get a 10, 12 year old female she's been around for a long time she's smart as can be and often they find that those big females mature females won't come anywhere near those traps and so you need other things so we've actually used with quite some success what we call a judas pig so you capture an animal put a gps satellite collar on it let it go track it and then use that to find sounder groups and those nothing finds wild pigs better than a wild pig and so you can track them and follow them and so judas pigs work really great uh, traps uh, certainly individual hunters who know what they're doing uh, and often like for example at Moose Mountain for probably I don't know, maybe on the order of 20 years now there's been a group of local uh, livestock producers that have actually been doing a lot of removal in and around the, the Moose Mountain uh, essentially on their own accord and their own effort and they these groups working together you know well communicated well trained folks what we might call a hunt team can also take out an entire sounder and so there are a few, that's just a few of the tools. Um, the US is working really aggressively on poison. Poison is a tricky one, but they're, they're putting a, a massive effort into uh, getting a, a nitrite based poison approved that might be part of the toolbox as well. So I think that you're probably rarely gonna find success with just one of those. Um, you probably need all, all, all of those and more. And, Okay, thanks for that answer. Um, there's a couple of listeners wondering about um, if uh, feral pigs are considered to be a disease vector to domestic wild, wild uh, sorry, domestic livestock, or if they could be naturally aggressive to other wildlife species like large ungulates. Yeah, absolutely. They are uh, incredibly aggressive, for sure. 
um, we do, uh, there was a video that I should, I should have shared as well, that um, up near PA this past winter, a school bus driver pulled over with a school bus full of kids and videotaped with his phone, uh, quite large wild pig putting the chase on a small group of cattle with some calves and, uh, and a cow. Um, now it didn't look particularly aggressive. And so we don't think that there's gonna be predation on cattle by these pigs. But we do, ha do know quite a number of occasions over the last 15 years where pigs have harassed cattle and pushed them off feed. And so they can be certainly aggressive even to cattle at that size. And so, yeah, they're, they are the bullies of the, of the ecosystem for sure. And they, especially when you get these big groups, they just incredibly, and, and they're a concern to people too, like um, in terms of we haven't seen attacks here in Saskatchewan or Canada. But this past winter, a woman was killed in her driveway, standing right near her car in the city by a pack of or a sounder of wild pigs. And so there are human safety concerns. Uh, there are concerns to uh, ecosystems, to deer and, and elk and potentially even moose getting chased away. Um, so absolutely, they are definitely, uh, not only do they rip apart ecosystems, wallow in the water, poop and feces in the water and destroy water quality and eat the ground nesting birds and potentially risk all sorts of species at risk. Uh, they do a lot of crop damage. They are highly aggressive to almost anything. And so, yeah, they're just not a great thing to have in your ecosystem at all. To answer your question about disease, that is a, a very, very important question for sure about that they can indeed host quite a number of uh, diseases of concern. There has not been a lot of disease testing done so far, and so we don't know much about disease in wild pigs in Canada. Uh, I think that's probably, I might argue, is the biggest gap in, in our knowledge in pigs in Canada is uh, you know having that disease testing to look at a whole host of things. One of the big global issues that has sort of been obscured by, by COVID and other things, but over the past year is this African swine fever. This is a disease only of pigs, but it's really been devastating to, you know, China killed several million domestic pigs because they had this African swine fever. Um, and many jurisdictions in Europe and Asia have been infected by this African swine fever disease. And unfortunately, in those both in Asia and in Europe, the wild boar, the native wild boar there have been shown to be reservoirs and vectors of disease. And in fact, there's several countries that either built or are working on fences separating entire countries, trying to keep the wild boar from moving, potentially spreading African swine fever. We have not found any in, uh, in any wild or, or uh, domestic pigs in Canada, in North America. But the reality is that even one case, you know, one domestic pig with African swine fever would be, I think the word catastrophic to the industry would be uh, a fair, or what I've heard experts who know a lot more about that on the domestic side than I do have said this would, you know, thinking back to the days of, was that 2003, there was one cow with mad cow or BSE and all our borders slammed shut, that would be kind of similar situation uh, if African swine fever were detected. So every single border to potentially ship would be was shut down. So, so disease is concerned to pets, it's concerned to humans. There was a massive recall of spinach in uh, California a few years ago, while pigs came in the night and defecated all over it and uh, had E. coli uh, on the spinach caused problems. So pets, humans, wildlife diseases we don't know really anything about that and certainly on the domestic side there are a number of uh, what we call reportable diseases that are really really critical to trade and the health of our of our livestock that are of a concern and so that's like i say that is probably the biggest gap that needs to be addressed in terms of one of the biggest anyway for sure uh having said that there has been testing done and nothing that has been particularly alarming found yet but uh it's amazing what you don't find when you don't look so yeah that's right what about chronic wasting disease um, we think that pigs can uh, potentially uh, spread it through their gut uh, they can potentially be infected as well um, CWD is a big unknown for pigs we've had I've had fecals in my freezer for a long long time now and nobody seems interested in testing them um, I don't know. I, I, given their movements, and uh, you know, I didn't speak to the movement data, but the collar data, we have 
you know, females in the order of 300 square kilometer home ranges and males, some are over 400 square kilometers. So they can move a lot. And the way they're dispersing around the prairies and into the boreal forest, um, you know, a lot of people have rightfully raised whitetail deer as a potential vector of CWD into the boreal um, and overlapping with caribou. But I think wild pigs could be part of that. And so CWD, in my view, should be uh, one of those things that we look at, um, both in terms of testing, but also in, you know, looking at what we call disease ecology, which is the movements and interactions of animals with other animals as, uh, you know, where might those fecals end up when these animals are moving. So it's something that, I, again, I think should be on that uh, list for testing and, and certainly would I would celebrate get, having a look at that. But I also would say, and I think this is a critical point uh, with respect to disease, that the last thing anybody should do is just go out collecting a whole bunch of animals and just testing for things. Because, it, you know, I think we really need to be ready for the consequences of, okay, if you do find CWD in pigs, well, what, what happens? Is there, there is no management plan for CWD um, in Saskatchewan that I'm aware of, and there's no management plan for wild pigs in Saskatchewan that I'm aware of. And so, so to some degree, I guess my concern would be that if you look for some of these things, if there's no plan to respond and no, you know, no overall comprehensive plan to eradicate or control wild pigs, is anything going to change or what is the response? And so I guess that's, to my mind, one of the big unknowns. Yeah, for sure. Uh, there's a couple questions about um, collars. Um, one question is how many collared pigs are being monitored in Saskatchewan? And a listener named Daniel says uh, he hears it's difficult to install radio collars on these wild pigs. And are there other ways to track their movements? Great questions. Um, so the only uh, collar and tracking work that's been done in Canada is through our program. And so we did five years of that work. And so our last collar fell off last summer uh, in Manitoba. And so we haven't put out new collars in Saskatchewan. I guess the last ones went out in 20, February of 2017. And so 2018, uh, those collars, uh, they have a, a time mechanism to fall off. And so for the last two years, there hasn't been any collaring of pigs, um, uh, no deployments in the last two years anywhere in Canada. Um, I think there's a lot of opportunity to do more and learn from that, not only the ecology, but again, this idea of Judas pigs. Um, so they're, it's expensive. So we capture with helicopters and it's, uh, it is expensive, but you get a good broad spread of animals. Um, you sort of pick and choose your animals and make sure you get males and females and all that good stuff. So we've, now I should know the answer to this. I think we've had something like 38 animals collared total over those years, which is quite good for a wild pig study to find these suckers. The uh, first year we flew and flew and flew and we collared uh, exactly five animals. And so pretty small start. And, and it was it's certainly been the hardest research I've ever done in my life in all sorts of ways, but finding pigs is hard. Um, keeping collars on is also hard because you look at this photo, look at the size of that neck and the neck is actually bigger than the head. And so uh, slippage of these collars is a problem. And that is some people have experimented with sort of straps that go around the legs. We've avoided that for animal care reasons. Um, there are, there is some work on ear transmitters, but we think those are probably going to get ripped out pretty well. Um, yeah, the collars so far are the best and we've had some fairly good success and we've learned a lot from it. So I think we could call her fairly well. We've actually, amazingly, despite my initial concern, in fact, was that we we're gonna call her all these pigs and everybody's gonna shoot them all. But in fact, hunter success on these collared animals has been very, very low. Uh, one animal we had, we recollared and actually had on for two years and uh, it was never harvested. So um, the harvest rates are actually very, very low. Certainly that's one thing we learned from collaring in Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, for sure. So I think there's opportunities for more collaring. It's expensive, um, but it can be a, an important part of a tool in the toolbox. And so, for example, if you were ground trapping and had a very aggressive ground trapping game, um, you could take one animal. So you say you caught tonight, you caught 16 wild pigs in a trap. You could euthanize those and do your normal removal, but you could keep one or two animals, put a collar on it, potentially even give it a vasectomy or or uh, or other whether with with drugs or surgery could make it even sexually non-reproductive 
re release it out into the wild, and then use that to find more pigs. And that can be done very, very successfully. So there's real opportunities there. The collars are not cheap either. So this is, but again, at the stage we're at with wild pigs so well established over what is now a, a million square kilometers, I think that uh, the window for action is very, very small at this point. And so the only option to get really successful is to have every tool in the toolbox out there, collars, ground trapping like crazy, uh, kill teams, potentially poison if that's something that governments decide they want to do. I know it's a, a tricky one in all kinds of ways, but at the same time, given the impacts of pigs, the US is saying we got to do everything we can. And so they fund tens of millions of dollars of efforts from, uh, and they do actually shoot from helicopters as well. I'm not, uh, uh, I have not supported that. And shooting from a helicopter has all sorts of challenges and safety and, and ethical perspectives. So I'm not an advocate of that directly. But um, you know, one of the first things the US did with their big allocation is buy two helicopters and half a million rounds of ammunition. So uh, they can certainly remove a lot of pigs that way as well. Um, and we've got one more question left, if that's okay. Um, a listener named Bob with uh, Ducks Unlimited Canada said uh, last fall and winter, he saw several newspaper articles reporting that some people, um, including Ray Orb of Farm, were calling into question the number of wild boar being reported. How do you respond to their assertions? Uh, it's it's a, a fair and important question. Um, wh well, what is the the, the data? I will say, I guess, um, that we are reporting the data that we have in hand, and we do a tremendous amount of analysis and comparison of that before we publish or release any of those sightings. Um, part of the challenge is that pigs are very much out of sight, out of mind, and so. Uh, in most places where we've worked, there are a lot more pigs, and we've confirmed that through when flying with helicopters and collars and cameras. There are a lot more pigs out in the landscape than most people think. That's certainly been a major outcome of our research for sure, and that surprised uh, me as much as anybody. I mean, you know, I'm the only scientist in Canada that's done long-term research uh, on wild pigs and has an active research program on them, and so We've been learning as we go, but one of the things I will say when Ruth started with me in 2004 was she was gonna do her master's. And I said, well, I don't know if there's enough wild pig sightings in Canada to do this map, but I think we should try and have a backup plan. Well, and the more you dig and the more you ask, and, and again, we have thousands and thousands and thousands of trail camera photos, and we have uh, certainly tens of thousands of GPS collar points. Uh, we have photographs from hunters sending in many hundreds of photos of pigs that they've shot. So uh, those data are what they are. Um, and there's no question that I, we get challenged on this a lot. Many people suggest that, you know, this is that there's not nearly as many as as we're saying, but the maps that we're showing are backed up by verified data, right? So and we triangulate that with many other data sets. And so uh, I think that people can, you know, are welcome to their opinion. But one of the things that probably my favorite saying in science uh, is, you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson says that, you know, science is true whether you believe in it or not. And so the facts remain that, you know, this photo that we're staring at right now is a verified location of a pig in an exactly specific site in Manitoba. Um, and so our data are, are pretty overwhelmingly on that. And I could, you know, one, one of these days, I think, because I do get that a lot. I'm, one of these days I'm gonna do a 45 or 50 minute presentation and just show you 4,000 photos of pigs from all over Canada um, and sort of address that and say, well, here's here's pig one, pig two, pig three. Uh, the data have just simply overwhelmed us. And uh, as it turns out, we're so far the only ones with any data on any of this. And we've really been blown away by how much we've seen in the last few years. And while we did predict it in 2010, 2011, we said, you know, based on what we know, we think that what we know about pigs is that they're probably going to go nowhere else but up. Uh, and they have done exactly that with the with the data we've collected. So that's that's the best answer I have right now. It's a fair question. It's an important one. And, and I know that there's a lot of confusion out there about all of this, that they're not seeing them, but yet we're seeing a lot of the data. I think that 
um, because they're such an elusive species, this is probably makes them that that represents one of our biggest challenges is that and and speaks to probably the slow response that we're seeing in a lot of jurisdictions to this is that well, yeah, Ryan, we see what you're saying, but nobody's seen them in the last five years here, despite the fact that we have trail camera photos and colors and everything else. So, so that's all I'll say for now. Um, but if you want to read further, we have published quite a number of papers on this, and we have six more that are going in right away for submission. And so peer-reviewed science uh, is as good as we can do. Um, and we're more than happy to share all those results to anybody who's interested. That's awesome. Well, I know we've run over time here, but um, I really want to thank you for um, spending time and extra time answering all of our questions today and for the fabulous presentation. And um, to all of our listeners for tuning in, thank you so much. Uh, when you leave this webinar, there'll be a quick one minute survey. If you don't mind filling it out, then uh, they'll give us some data to report back to our funders. So we can keep our speaker series going into the future. So with that, thank you so much, everyone. Um, and Dr. Brooks, there's been a number of uh, listeners um, typing in saying awesome presentation. Thank you so much. So thanks, that, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you. And have a great rest of your day. Take care. Bye. Bye.